Shalom everyone and good morning. I, I guess it's not good morning, it's good afternoon for me. It's already 12.20 p.m. Christchurch, New Zealand. And um, <clears throat> behind me is the beautiful park that is right next to the, uh, the central business district of the city. There's a little river, I don't know if you can see, a small little creek actually that is running along that park. And I'm in a nice place. Um, I, will be, be, I will be picked up um, in about a couple hours and uh, they'll show me a little bit around. And then I'm going to be speaking tonight at Calvary Chapel of Christchurch. Um, <clears throat> again, I just want to praise the Lord for the wonderful, wonderful time I've had so far. The saints in Japan and now the saints in Perth, Australia. It was so amazing, mind-blowing. Um, for me, it was a humbling experience to see people uh, coming from all over uh, the country to listen. The churches were packed. There was no room to sit. People were standing. And it, it was because people are hungry. One of the pastors told me, Amir, it's not true that the church is dying, but the church is starving. He says, uh, that's, that's the thing. You know, we have people coming to faith all around the world. It's, in, it's the fastest uh, growing, uh, um, in a way, faith um, in the Western world. It's just that the problem is not growth people come to christ but they're not being fed right and so <clears throat> and they were so happy to get an understanding not only on on what is going on in the middle east but also in the uh, in the doctrine of what is it that israel means uh, it, in the word of god and why is it to the jew first uh, we had a whole message on that alone um, and then we talked also about the temple and i know some of you ask for that message we uploaded it on youtube the next temple the problem was that and we already had like 20,000 people watching it but the main complaint was the volume was too low so we removed it we fixed it and we uploaded it again so if you want to hear it in a in a better volume just go to youtube to our my recent message, The Next Temple, where I'm basically explaining everything from the Garden of Eden, from where God was walking in the garden, dwelling among His people, all the way to the tabernacle in the wilderness, and the first temple, and the second temple, and the third temple. We even talked about the fourth temple. We talked about, of course, the New Jerusalem, and where there is no temple. So it, it's, it's a it's a message that will give you a nice understanding, especially in light of all the junk that is being given to you regarding new locations of the temple and new, new theories. All of this is junk, is people who want to sell books and nothing that they write or say matches the evidences on the ground. So we're going to, if you want to know more about the temple, um, because the temple is the heart of the Jerusalem conflict and Jerusalem is the heart of the Israel conflict and Israel is the heart of the Middle East conflict and Middle East is the heart of the world conflict. And so if you want to understand it, just watch that message online. We just put it on YouTube, the next temple, and you're going to be blessed. Um, short announcement for all of my beloved Canadian uh, friends. Um, for reasons which I cannot tell you right now, um, the board of Behold Israel decided that I should not go to the conference on the 22nd of September of uh, September in British Columbia in Sur Surrey. Um, I really prefer not to go into it. Um, I just want to move forward. Um, we open a Behold Israel Canada. It's a registered society, a uh, non-profit. Um, and we would, we will definitely start, we do conferences our own way. Um, <clears throat> and again, um, let's not go into the reasons why I had to cancel my participation, but I just want you to connect with us via Canada at BeholdIsrael.org. Let us know if you're interested that we will come and teach. 
And uh, again, Canada at BeholdIsrael.org. I'm going to put together a conference, most likely in the Toronto area. Um, and most likely it's going to be either this September or early next year. But I not only that I didn't forget my Canadian uh, um, friends, but I actually have them heavy on my heart. And I will definitely be there and we'll do things a little differently. So again, uh, September 22nd, I will not be there in that conference. Um, and I, we will keep in touch with you if you let us know your name, your email address, and if you want to throw your your physical address or your phone number. So shoot us an email to Canada at BeholdIsrael.org. I will come to Canada. We will have a conference. It will be great. I already have someone that will also speak with me, um, but um, it's not going to be on the 22nd. So I just wanted to make it clear. Um, go ahead and and um, make the arrangements um, for that. Canada at BeholdIsrael.org. Um, and our conferences uh, will be a little bit different and much cheaper, that's for sure. So, um, we, um, we're going to move right now to the current events update. And uh, we're going to go, first of all, back to the events of the rockets in Gaza and all of that. You know that for the longest time I've been telling you that this whole Gaza conflict is like a three-year-old picking up on a, uh, for a fight with an 18-year-old. It, it's really not even anything even here. The Palestinians nowhere can are matching power to Israel. And Israel could, if Israel really wanted, could, could destroy Gaza within probably 20 minutes. We never wanted to. We don't want to. I don't think we intend to. Uh, but we, um, over the last week, we decided that uh, enough is enough with all of their shenanigans. They don't really, I mean, they did kill one Israeli soldier. Uh, but, you know, when you send 200, 300, 400 rockets and, and you only have one casualty and that causes you to celebrate, that shows how pathetic you are. Um, Israel decided to destroy 60 targets the Palestinian Hamas ran to the Egyptians and begged them to tell Israel to stop and they will agree for a ceasefire, which they did, finally. And that's it. So Israel doesn't want to deal with the Gaza. We don't want to go into Gaza. We don't want to control over 2 million Gazans right now because our eyes are on the north. And that's where I'm going right now. We're still... Uh, can see uh, attempts of the Iranians to entrench themselves in Syria. The Hezbollah is doing that in militias that the Iranian general Soleimani gathered from Pakistan and from Afghanistan and from Iraq. These are foreign soldiers, Shiite soldiers. They're like meat for the Iranians to sacrifice for their thing. Um, so um, what happened is that we, we've noticed that they have more and more and more. So Israel attacked at least twice over the last week. Um, we have destroyed several targets. In fact, the targets we destroyed, I'm not allowed to talk about. So I'm not even going to tell you what is it that we destroyed. Um, yesterday, there were some red alerts. Um, some um, Israel uh, noticed uh, rockets flying um, too close to us. Apparently, it was the fighting of Assad versus the rebels on the Golan. And uh, for the first time, Israel used our newest defense system called David's Sling. I love that we've got uh, biblical names to all of our defense systems. We've got our, our, our tanks, our chariots, our rockets, our arrows. And uh, the defense system now is uh, David's Sling. And um, we shot two rockets from this new thing in order to pull down Syrian rockets that, by the way, never really fell on our territory, but fell in their territory. But we needed to make sure they will not fly towards us. And the, the Syrians are now dealing with a terrible, terrible situation in the south of the country. Um, and uh, now listen to, listen to this. 
a lot of people are attacking President Trump for his meeting with Putin, but um, very few people understand the significance of that meeting for the security of Israel. And let me, let me, first of all, I believe they had a great meeting. I believe that unlike other presidents in the past, he didn't give the Russians anything. He actually received from the Russians, just like he did with North Korea. He received from the Russians the assurances that they will be handling the Israeli-Syrian border and not any other militias or any other organization. Now, you're probably saying, wait a minute, Amir, it's not good for Israel. Well, at the moment, it's better than having the other option. And prophetically, it's perfect because the Russians are now officially in an international agreement, including Israeli agreement, the Russians are parked on the border with Israel with an international mission to stop others from coming towards Israel. Do you hear what I'm saying? President Trump, Benjamin Netanyahu, have given their green light to have the Russians on the border. Now, you will say, how can they do that? But you don't understand something. It has to happen. Not only that it has to happen, at the moment, it looks like the best thing for Israel. Now, just like the third temple looks like the best thing for the Jews right now. We know it's a mistake. We know it's going to be a horrible uh, consequences to it. But for the Jews, at the moment, and at the time that they will construct the temple, it's the best thing. So you have to separate yourself from, from the uh, concerns of the moment for Israel. God is sovereign. And God will make sure that everything is going to happen His way. But the leaders of the world don't know that. So Benjamin Netanyahu right now agreed for something. President Trump, in attempt to help Benjamin Netanyahu, and with the understanding that it's good for Israel, had agreed that the Russians will be the landlords along the border with Israel. The Russians destroyed systematically all the towns in the south. I have pictures. I have videos. It is unbelievable damage. The rebels gave up. And all of that is because the alternative would be worse. So we as believers, we live in that conflict of knowing what's going to happen at the end and also understanding the need of the moment at right now. And instead of being concerned, we have to praise God that everything happens and falls in the right place and, and it's not falling uh, apart, it's falling in the right place, as we always say. So, again, you have to understand, President Donald Trump, with the attempt to secure the Israeli border with Syria, after consulting with Benjamin Netanyahu, had agreed for Netanyahu to give the green light to Vladimir Putin to have his soldiers along the border. I hope it's clear. In return, ask me what we got. In return, we received green light and car blanche to attack any Iranian target in Syria and without any intervention or interruption from the Russians. So I hope you understand that we are watching historical things. And the eyes of the Israeli military, although Gaza is unknowing, Gaza is not our existential problem. It is the Golan right now. It is Syria. It is Iran where our eyes are, are watching right now. And you must understand something, guys. The days where the Arabs were our problems are over. Are over. You must memorize that. You must understand that the first tier of countries are no longer there. Jordan needs Israel more than Israel needs Jordan. Egypt needs the peace with Israel more than Israel needs the peace with, with Egypt. You, you must understand right now, those countries' stability depends on their 
friendship with Israel and the alliance that Israel has with the United States, you must also understand that those days that Israel was afraid of Lebanon or Syria or Egypt or Iran or, 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 or uh, Jordan, those days are over. We're not afraid of Assad. We're great friends with, with the Jordanians. And we are now speaking in completely different terms. The entire terminology, the entire terminology of the Israelis right now are, is, is we're using Iran, Turkey, Russia. Iran, Turkey, Russia. We're not talking about other things. And for that, Israel is, is having new alliances, regional alliances. Against the Turks, we cut an alliance with Cyprus and with Greece. Against the Iranians, we have an alliance with Saudi Arabia right now, Jordan and Egypt. Against the Russians, we've got the greatest alliance with the United States. You must understand, this is the game right now. And we, we have to use our brains. You're not going to change the Bible. But you're going to change where you are, where those things happen, in the way you live and your in the decisions that you make. So, to give you an example, okay, um, a Saudi writer, Ahmad El Arfaj, he says, normalization of ties with Israel is on the agenda. We have a greater problem with Iran. He also said. Arab leaders such as Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi that wanted to destroy Israel, they're gone, while Israel prospers and getting stronger. Basically, the Arabs around us understood that they can This is something significant, very significant. Why? Because I told you that I believe that Psalm 83 not only took place, but it is a precise description of the beginning of Israel's existence as a sovereign state, 1948 and 1967. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. Think about it. The Bible talks in Psalm 88 about three major things. One, the enemies are the enemies of God, not of Israel, but they go against Israel. So it's a religious thing. And it's about someone who worships other God. So it's not financial. It's spiritual. Second, it speaks of the Arab countries surrounding Israel. It speaks of Tyre and Sinai. It speaks of the inhabitants of Lebanon, of, of Gebal and Ammon and Moab and the Hagarites and, and the Ishmaelites. This is all the, the names of Egypt and Jordan and Syria. All the neighboring countries. And the Bible says that they are going to come and destroy Israel, that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. It means that suddenly the name of Israel came back and they want to destroy it. When was it that Israel was pronounced Israel, back as a state called Israel? 1948. When was it? By the way, the Bible says Assyria even came to help them, which is Iraq of today. 1948. Believe it or not, Iraq through Jordan, Kaukaji, the general Kaukaji, they invaded also. They were part of the attacking coalition against Israel. Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, all of those, exactly as that psalm says. And the Bible says that they will be put to shame. Think about it. Five Arab massive armies versus a small Jewish community of people who have no military background who had no equipment, who had no chance. And guess what? They lost and they were ashamed. And in so many descriptions, they say we saw thousands of Israeli soldiers when we didn't even have one. They were ashamed. God showed himself in a mighty way in so many things. So my point is this. The days that the Arab neighbors ganged up against Israel to destroy it so it will not be called Israel are over. The days today are Israel is strong, Israel is prosperous, Israel has so much that others want, 
And the next conflict with Russia and Turkey and Iran will be about the spoils, will be about things to take from us, things to, it's financial gain. You must understand in, in Ezekiel 38 is not about the name of Israel and let us cut them off from, it, from being a nation. It's to come and take and steal. And the Lord will once again intervene. Only this time, it will be with an earthquake. It will be with some supernatural intervention. And it seems like God is testing the ground in the last few weeks. And Israel is definitely having those minor earthquakes, even one yesterday. Um, and of course, several two weeks ago and, and one week ago. So, guys, let's put things in the right perspective. And I'm telling you that because it's, I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine Jordan turn against Israel again and Egypt turns against Israel again when they are supported by the Saudis financially. They cannot live without the Saudi support. And as, as of now, I just told you the Saudis, the Saudis themselves says it is within our interest to actually align with Israel because our common enemy is Iran. So I hope you understand that. We see a great transition from Psalm 83 where we were so small. They wanted to take our land, not to steal from us anything. They want to take the land. They want to re remove the name. That was it in 1948. And it says the pastures of God. That means the land that was dead became green, and now they want it. That, it's the whole story of 1948. It's amazing how people cannot see it. And the next thing, right now, that's it. The Arab Spring destroyed most of our, our surroundings, shattered it to pieces. And while Israel is stronger and stronger, the eighth most strongest country in the world right now. So you need to understand, we had an amazing transition within 70 years from being the prey of Psalm 83 to being the desired target of Ezekiel 38. An amazing 180 degrees from being helpless and with no one and ganged up uh, all, all around uh, by the, by the um, um, surrounding nations to now living in peace with, with our neighbors. So probably you're saying, Amir, it doesn't look like there's peace in Israel. 99% of the Israelis live in peace. There's few thousands of people live in the surroundings of the Gaza Strip. And, uh, and yeah, it's not that safe over there right now with the Hamas periodically, uh, sh uh, you know, doing some shenanigans. But that's it. In fact, the latest survey shows that 90% of the Israelis feel safer than ever. Safety is not whether there is a rocket or not. Safety is your feeling as a, and I can tell you that people in Chicago do not feel safe. And I can tell you that more people die in Chicago every day than, than the whole year, I think, in, in Israel from terror attacks. So you must understand to put things in perspective. And, um, and I just wanted, you know, to, to, to tackle that issue once again, because it's important that we understand that the next thing that we're watching happening is the Russian entrenchment on our border, the Iranian attempt to do the same, the Turkish frustration from Israel's rising success and Israel's new alliances also with our neighbors, which is Turkey's neighbors. We're watching amazing things. We are a generation that will most likely see and experience the things that the Bible talked about for 2,000 years and no one else before us ever seen or experienced. This is why I am so persistent in telling people to get ready, telling people not to count the days and the hours, not to look and, and, and say it happens on July 28th or September 13th or this or that, but to get ready, to get ready with their own life, to, to live 
a life of someone who is about to see his Savior shortly and who is about to be asked, what did you do for me in this world, in this life which I gave you? This is the time for us to put aside, as Romans 13 says, everything that is a, of a hindrance and to put on Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. So this is why it is so super important that we um, get ready and assume once again uh, the role of watchmen on the walls and, and to understand our uh, um, mission to occupy, to share the gospel with everyone in season, out of season. Whether, trust me, people are hungry. People are thirsty. People don't hear the word of God anymore. I'm watching people forward to me messages from big name pastors and I'm so ashamed to see that they're not even preaching the gospel. This is not the Bible that I know. The word repentance is not there. The word sin is not there. The, the word um, uh, God judgment is not there. It's all fluff. You know, people must understand it is appointed, it is appointed upon man once to die and to be judged. There is judgment. And the judgment is because of our sinful nature. And when God offers a solution, and when God offers us a way out, and when God says, look, I extend my hand, and we say, no, we don't want it, that's when you will be judged. It is as simple as that. But a lot of people don't know about that extended hand, about the solution, about the hope and peace. By the way, people have no hope and people have no peace because nobody tells them. So we need to tell them. We need to tell them that there is hope and there is peace. And it's in Jesus. They won't find it here. This world, as peaceful it might look, as beautiful as it might look, is nothing. You know, I've been to beautiful places. And I've seen enough people that are so satisfied with what they see and have, or wherever they are. Now, I'll tell you something. The Bible says, No, no eye has seen and no ear has heard. And it, it didn't come to, the, to an, anyone's heart even. That which God has prepared for us. There is the most beautiful place in this world cannot even compare to what God has for us. The most amazing peace that you may find here does not compare to that which God has for us. Now, a lot of you are very, very tired. Some of you are even sad. But you must understand it is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Within ourselves, maybe we cannot find the joy but, but we need to, that's when we need to go back to the Scriptures. And in the Scriptures, we can see God's Word and God's hope and God's peace. And, when, and the more we are soaking ourselves with the Word of God, the more we find joy and peace. But most importantly, the more we are able to detect and discern bad teaching and, 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 and false teachers. I want to tell you something. The more... You get to hear God's Word and understand and see God's Word, the more you understand what is not from Him. The easier it is for you to see, oh, that's not from God. I mean, I don't see it aligned with anything I know in the Scriptures. So, I just want to encourage all of you, as much as possible, to be in the Word in order not only to understand what's going on, but also to find there your peace and your joy and your hope. Because we are not like people without hope. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, don't be like those without hope. Yes, some of you may have died, but they, they just went to sleep. If you're in Christ, then you don't die. It's not death as far as death in the mind of Paul the Apostle is the complete separation from God. That's what the eternal death is going to be. In hell, it's complete separation from God. But for us, we're not separate. Nothing can separate us from from the love of God. No, no, no. The, neither the height, nor the depth, uh, neither death or nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So for us, we are with Him when we're alive, and when we die, we just go to sleep, but we're still with Him. And the day will come when we will be resurrected. 
and then we will see him physically and be with him forever. So for us, we must understand even the worst thing, which is death, is not that bad at all. So I just wanted to encourage you in the Middle East right now, right now, we've got the situation in Syria that our eyes are you know, focused on. We've got the Palestinian issue, which is a non-issue. I've been telling you that. Every time you guys are so scared, red alert, red alert. Some of you are like, you know, I think you've got, you're more scared than the Israelis themselves. Red alert is, is, is an app where you can see that Israelis are alerted that rockets are flying, or at least we detect something. Um, guys, it's nothing. It's, trust me, when you see red alerts coming from the north, from the north the evil shall come. If you see that coming from the north, that's when you have to worry. That's why uh, yesterday I was a little, a little, a little bit, um, um, I, I wouldn't say concerned, but it, it, it sounded a, a bit strange to me that we had several red alerts from the north. And then we, of course, understood that this is the fighting of the Syrian regime with the rebels in the south. And we just, we could hear, come to northern Israel right now, come to the Golan Heights right now. You're going to hear booms. It's not in Israel, but we hear it because it's not too far. And, uh, and that's what it's all about. So, you know, I want you to stay in the word and stay with the Lord and, and um, do not be saddened and affected by the things of the world. We have to, I always love to, to quote that which <clears throat> Jeremiah the prophet uh, wrote in chapter 17. He says this, <clears throat> Uh, blessed is the man, verse 7, who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. He says, For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green. And it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. So it's not like bad things are not going to happen drought, um, heat, but we will have the leaves and we will flourish. And that is only if our trust is not in the things of the world. Blessed is the man whose trust, who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. Look, as much as it seems like I'm a great supporter of Donald Trump, or Benjamin Netanyahu. My trust is not in them. You got it all wrong if you think that way. My trust is in the Lord. And the moment will come. Obviously, if Israel is going to have such a great attack, that means that neither one of the leaders will be able to stop it. And then what? Are we going to accuse them? No. It's going to happen. And I'm not banking on Donald Trump to stop the Russians from attacking Israel. They will. And I'm not banking on Benjamin Netanyahu to stop the attack on Israel because they will. My trust is not in politicians. But when I see that they are God sent for the time, for this reason, for a reason, for a season, then I'm not attacking them. I am supporting them. But the day will come. The day will come. And they will make mistakes. And Israel will be attacked. But the Lord will be there. That's why my trust is in the Lord. Blessed is the man who's, who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. So who do you trust and who is your trust today? Politicians? Is it men around you? Family? Is it the Lord? That's what you need to remember. So we must understand there's issues going on in Syria. There's issues going on in northern Israel, but we must understand everything happens for a reason and the right season, and God is in full control. And the last thing that God is going to tolerate is to be mocked and ridiculed. I was reminded this week of the story in 
in uh, Isaiah uh, of King, um, the king of Assyria that um, came to attack Israel. And he came all the way to Lachish, Lachish you call it. And he sent a, a, a scroll to King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. And King Hezekiah came to the temple and fell right there on his knees and says, Lord, look, the king of Assyria is coming to take us. How can you allow that? Open your eyes, open your ears to see. I mean, we are begging you. And then he sent a messenger to Isaiah the prophet, who was the prophet at that time, and said, can you hear something from God? Can you tell me what's God's response? And, and, and Isaiah says, yes, listen to this. God is saying to uh, King Sennacherib, Sennacherib, by the way, in Hebrew, God is telling him, I have ordained your attack. I've known this. I know all of your thoughts. But I want to tell you something. You come against my people and you're boasting against them and against me. And then God, through the prophet Isaiah, says to King Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, I'm going to put a hook. Sounds familiar? The hook. I'm going to put a hook in your uh, 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 head, nose, mouth, whatever. Turn you around and send you to where you came from. Wow. And the next day, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers died. A couple of years later, King Sennacherib was assassinated by who? By his own children. Do not mock God. Do not come against God. And do not think for a second that God is not in control. God is in full control. He knows what's going to happen. He ordains things. If you read Ezekiel 38 so well, you see that God says to Gog, I cause you to come. And I will also judge you. In other words, God knows their thoughts. He is allowing it. He knows. It's not like they sneak behind God's back. He is allowing it. But then He's going to judge them for it. So God knows the thoughts of man's heart. And God will judge man accordingly. And, and again, judgment is there. And in order to escape the judgment of God, we must have the Holy Spirit and we must accept Jesus, who is our counselor, our um, praklit uh, in, in, in Greek and in Hebrew also. He is the one who intercedes for us, who is the one who, who is the pure Lamb of God who shed a blood that is much better than any animal. And God is looking at us through the filter of the blood of Jesus and we look perfect and we look pure. Not because of us, but because of the blood of Jesus. But it can only happen if we apply that blood. It can only happen when we believe only faith in Jesus and, his, and in His finished work on the cross will only save us. We cannot be saved by our own works, but our own deeds. Somebody came to me in Australia and says, I believe that um, Gentiles should keep the Sabbath because it's part of the Word of God. And I told him, since when the law ever saved anyone? Read Acts 15, when Peter himself said, Guys, why are we going to put on the Gentiles that burden the shackles that even our fathers could not bear. If we cannot do it, if we cannot as Jews fulfill the law, why are we going to expect the Gentiles to? When we know that faith in Jesus alone can save them and us. So we have to, we have to remember that. So... I hope this update gave you an, an understanding of the situation and the transition that Israel had from being surrounded by Arabs who wanted to destroy to being now a superpower that is threatened by other countries. Uh, I hope you understand the transition from Psalm 83 to Ezekiel 38. The, the 83 became 38. And I hope you understand, folks, uh, that um, our hope is not in leaders, but our hope is in the Lord. Our trust is in the Lord. Um, last thing, folks, I would like to remind my Canadian friends, contact us at Canada at BeholdIsrael.org for our future conferences in Canada. 
Um, again, I will not be there in September 22nd, um, but I will. We are going to put together a conference, and we're going to let you know if you let us know your email address. So please write, everyone, write to Canada at BeholdIsrael.org. Let us know your name, your phone, your address, whatever you want to let us know so we can contact you and tell you personally of our next event in Canada. Australia was amazing. I'm going to go back to Australia. I love Perth. We'll be back in, in, in Melbourne and Sydney as well. And I'm, I'm super excited about my visit to New Zealand. I'm here in Christchurch. Behind me is the park of the city. And I will be speaking here in five different places before I'm heading back home. Uh, thank you so much for your prayers, for your support, for uh, your concerns, uh, uh, for my health, for my back. A lot of people are praying for my back. It's not easy to travel. It's not easy to change hotels, change mattresses, being on the plane for many, many hours. Yeah, I, I do have lower back pains from the age of 25, uh, 24 when I had a terrible car accident in the Philippines where I nearly died. I was in a wheelchair for a while. I was flown to a hospital. They treated me there. I was badly injured. And from that point on, um, that was my first ever ministry tour. And this, the enemy tried to take me out. And so since then, I have lower back issues, and I take care of it as much as I can. Um, sleeping pills are helping uh, to sleep and get over the time differences. So thank you again for your uh, concerns, for your prayers, and for your support. We're very, very blessed. Um, let's end up this update. Again, we remind you to um, follow us on Instagram, Behold Israel, Facebook, Behold Israel, YouTube, Behold Israel, and also Twitter, Behold Israel. Let me finish this update with the ironic blessing upon all of you. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panavelecha v'yichuneka. Yisa Adonai panavelecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine His face towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance towards you and give you His peace, His shalom. That peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace that the world cannot give, nor can the world understand. It's the peace that only the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Peace, can give you. Now and forever, here and everywhere. In the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua, our salvation. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Thank you. I love you. God bless you. I remind the Canadians, guys, write to Canada at BeholdIsrael.org. We're going to start a Behold Israel in Australia as well. We want to make sure to come and, and feed the saints here as well. And um, I'm very excited about New Zealand right now. And the Lord is opening doors. And uh, last night it was a bit awkward. I was held in the immigration for an hour. Um, it was my first time to enter. They didn't know who I am, how to take me, this whole thing. I mean, who is it? A Bible teacher shows up. They took my fingerprints. They took my picture. They went through my wallet, my itinerary. I mean, I don't know. But here I am. I'm in. I'm actually, <laughs> I was given a tourist visa for three months, which I don't need. I only need eight days. And uh, I'm okay. So the enemy tried to hinder me from coming, but I'm here. So, thank you, I love you, God bless you, and shalom from Christchurch, New Zealand. Bye-bye.